Bibles to the shortest book in the New Testament, the little epistle of 3 John. 3 John. We started this last week and considered an overview of the book, and really we considered just verses 1 and 2. Just to refresh your mind on some of the high points from last week's study, 2 John and 3 John were obviously written by the same person. It refers to themselves at the outset of the book, not by name, but by a title, the elder. Does that mean an older man, or does that mean an officer in the church? Elder, pastor, the term that we use, overseer, all synonymous terms. And then there's the common theme in 2nd and 3rd John. It's the word truth repeatedly used and the word love repeatedly used. And so the writing style, the sentence structures, indicates that whoever wrote 2nd and 3rd John was the same individual. But the key question is, who was that individual? In our Bibles, it's called 2nd John and 3rd John, and the implication is that the Apostle John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Gospel of John, and the Book of Revelation. And there has been a debate down through the centuries, even from the earliest time. The earliest church fathers did not have a consensus on this. Some say the author was indeed the Apostle John. Others say it is some other John whom we may not know about from the scriptures itself. Whoever wrote this, whoever was the human instrument, it seems quite obvious that it was the Spirit of God that prompted the heart of this writer to pen these words. So, let me read last week's text, very short, John verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Obviously, there was a very strong bond between the author of this epistle and this man named Gaius. And we're not sure who Gaius was. There are other men in the New Testament referred to as Gaius, very common name. We're not sure if it was one of the three or four men mentioned in the New Testament or if it's some other unknown Gaius to us. He continues in verse 2, beloved. He just called him beloved. He just said that he loved him, but once again he emphasizes the fact that he loves this recipient. I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. And as I said, we considered that last week. Our text this morning begins in verse 3 and concludes at the end of verse 8. With your Bibles and your hearts open, would you follow along as I read? For I was very glad... When brethren came and bore witness to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, once again that affectionate term, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they, that is, these strangers, bear witness to your love before the church. And you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, because they accepted nothing from the Gentiles, therefore, we ought to support such men that we may be fellow workers with the truth. As we said, love and truth, reoccurring themes in 2nd and 3rd John. So what this portion is, verses 3 through 8, is a, a note of commendation to the recipient of this epistle, this man named Gaius. And verses 3 and 4 deals with this idea of walking truthfully. That's what he will use in this very portion here. We have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth, of which Gaius was one of those children. We considered last week this probably indicated that Gaius was a convert of the author. He he came to saving 
knowledge through the preaching of this author, the elder. So let's consider verses 3 and 4 about walking truthfully. First thing to consider is the report. Uh, the author, this elder, talks about the brethren, fellow Christians, came and bore witness to your truth. And this is considered a commendable thing, that brethren, plural, came, number one, and secondly, they bore witness to your truth, the truth that you have. Now, who are the brethren? Well, it could be travelers, Christians who were traveling through that area, fellowshiped with the believers, where you live, Gaius, and uh, they encountered you and they were so excited to meet you. You greatly encouraged them. You were edifying to them. It could be travelers or secondly, it could be teachers. And it would seem to be from the context of this to be traveling teachers, which was very common in the New Testament. We see that indicated in some of the New Testament books. That there were elders in local congregations, but there were often traveling teachers that came to these congregations, a whole series of them in the course of a year. Second thing that you and I don't see in English, but it's there in the Greek language, that the verb tenses, the verb came and the verb bore witness, indicates this was a repeated event. The brethren just didn't come on one occasion, and one of them spoke these things. No, this was a reoccurring thing. All these traveling teachers, or just travelers, came and they were all saying the same thing. That Gaius, you were, you were commendable for walking in the truth. As we see in verse 4, the elder, whomever that is, talks about his reaction. He said, I was very glad... And then he sort of expands that in the next verse. He says, I have no greater joy. I can't think of anything that occurs in my life that gives me a greater amount of joy than to hear that my converts, my spiritual children, are walking in the truth. Really? Is that your priority, elder, if it is the Apostle John? That's the greatest joy you have. You, you mean that gives you greater joy than having a bumper crop from your garden? I, I mean, this year was amazing. I've never seen so much produce come off of our trees and our vines and, and out of the ground. I couldn't believe how much we harvested this year. The amount of rain, the sunshine was just perfect. I'm telling you, I've never ever in my life had a bumper crop like this. You mean hearing about your children walking in the truth gives you greater joy than a bumper crop? How about if you bought a new chariot? I mean, one of those fancy ones, you know, the extended models. It has extra room on the side there for your wife and kids to ride with you. You mean you have greater joy from hearing your children walking in truth than you do from a brand new upgraded chariot? How about the birth of someone in your family? your own child or a grandchild, you mean you have greater joy than hearing and seeing and holding a newborn that's part of your family. How about a visitor comes whom you haven't seen in years, who you were knit together in years by, gone by like this, and they drop by unexpectedly. You mean you have more joy over your converts walking in the truth than you do reconnecting a loved one. That's what he says. That makes me stop and ask, how's my priorities in light of this dear brother who wrote this book? What is the source of my greatest joy? Could I stick my big nose in your business? What gives you the greatest joy in life? Why does he have this Gladness that he describes as very glad. And this greatest joy, what is it? Well, he says here that you were walking in your truth. The brethren came, in verse 3, and they bore witness to your truth. Your truth. 
You, you mean you, Gaius, you have your own personal truth, which is different from everyone else's personal truth? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's not what he's talking about. He clarifies it at the end of verse 3 when he talks about your truth, that is how you were walking in truth. It's not your truth that you manufactured in your own head, wrote it down and said, this is what I believe. This is my personal premises and premonitions. No, this, your truth is the fact that you are living it. You are walking in it. The characteristics of your habits, your conduct, indicates that you are in the realm of truth. We said that 2nd and 3rd John bear great similarities. When the elder wrote 2nd John, you'll see on your notes there in verse 4, he says, I was very glad, same term, very glad, to find some of your children walking in the truth. Now, 2nd John was written to a woman. 3rd John is written to a man named Gaius. He says to this woman in 2nd John, I hear that some of your children, not all of them. You know, that's true in a lot of Christian parents who raise their kids and their kids are now uh, adults. And maybe some of them are believers and some aren't. Lois's parents had six kids. And the amazing thing is that all six of them were converted and married Christians. The next generation down, my nieces and nephews, Lois and our nieces and nephews, some of them walk with the Lord, but some of them don't, including of the, our three sons, two of them probably are not Christians. One is. No guarantees that just because mom and dad are saved that all of their kids will be, or even any of their kids will be, but if the Lord has been pleased to save some of your children, how thankful you should be. And keep praying, keep praying that his grace will be extended to those who are not at this point. Walking in the truth. Some of the kids of this ladies are walking in the truth. Gaius has been walking in the truth. I want to take a, an extended parenthesis here in the study. You'll see it there in your notes. That there were many professing Christians in the first century who ceased walking in the truth. It seemed like they started out in the realm of the truth, living and acting and walking that way, but then they backslid. <laughs> then they renounced the faith, either verbally or by their actions. Let me read for you a list of depressing verses, all telling us the same thing, that there were some who ceased to walk on the truth. Several of these come from the book of Galatia. Now, remember, remember this simple truth. Galatia is not a particular church in a city called Galatia. Galatia is a region. There were numerous churches in the region of Galatia. And, and Paul writes to the churches... And he makes these heartbreaking statements. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace. You've deserted him for a different gospel. A gospel that tried to blend the law of Moses with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I thought Jesus said you call no man fool, but Paul does by the inspiration of the scripture. He says, you foolish Galatians, who put the literally evil eye on you? Who hypnotized you, as it were? Galatians 4 how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless things? Well, the weak and worthless things he's talking about is the Mosaic law, which was obsolete, which was done away with, which was preached until the time of John. But after John came Christ to preach the gospel. How is it you Galatians are going back to the Old Testament, which was nothing more than pictures 
of the reality in Christ. How is that? Galatians 5, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You were doing great in your walk with Christ. Who is it that bamboozled you? Who is it that caused you to stop obeying the truth? Here's a cluster of churches in the region of Galatia. He, Paul makes this sweeping generality, but apparently it was true for all those churches. In the city of Colossae, there was a church. Paul writes to them and he says, why do you submit yourselves to decrees? Why do you put yourself under legalistic laws such as do not handle, do not taste, do not even touch it? Why would you put yourself under these type of man-made restrictions? Paul writes to his co-worker Timothy. Timothy's responsible for churches there in that region. He says, for some, and he's talking about widows, have already turned aside to follow Satan. Some of the widows, grieving for the loss of the husband they left, found themselves getting into relationships that were highly inappropriate. They followed Satan. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And some Christians, he's talking about, by longing for money, have wandered away from the faith. Some. He didn't say there was one person or a couple people that I know of. He said there was some. Second Peter. Peter writes about those who, having escaped the defilement of the world because of their conversion. They were new creatures in Jesus Christ. Having escaped the defilements of the world, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Overcome. Wrapped up. Can't break the bondage, the addictive habits, as it were. Jesus says in Revelation 2, remember from where you have fallen. He says that to the church of Ephesus. They left their first love. It's interesting, in the epistle to the church at Ephesus about 20 years before approximately, they were commended for their love, and they've fallen from it by this point. Revelation 2.14, you have there some who are holding the teaching of Balaam. Chapter 2, verse 20, you tolerate the woman Jezebel, not the resurrected or reincarnated Jezebel, but a woman who acted like the Old Testament queen Jezebel. She teaches and leads my bondservants, plural. She teaches and leads them astray in that church. Revelation 3, Jesus said to that church, wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. Little light, little candle light, just flickering on the verge of being extinguished. Well, you and I would look at these first century Christians and say, boy, these guys were pretty bad. You know what I mean? No perseverance with these guys. How worldly, how carnal were they in the first century? Now wait, before you and I start pointing our fingers of accusation against those early Christians, let me remind you about our generation. And when I say our generation, that's based on the assumption that we are the last generation. We may not be. There may be two, three, four, ten more generations before Jesus Christ comes. But look carefully at that verse in Luke 18 at the bottom of your notes. When the Son of Man comes, will he find, the definite article's there, it's not translated in English, will he find the faith on the earth? What do you suppose is the anticipated response to this question that Christ gave? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The implied response seems to be, mm, no, no. You and I should not be shocked or appalled when we read the statistics that the number of professing Christians in America has been decreasing in recent years. 
that the evangelical, the Bible-believing churches are decreasing in their membership and attendance in recent years, we shouldn't be flabbergasted to know that Christian church buildings are being boarded up. That the great big megalopolis churches that are being built, little miniature cities that gather on Sunday morning, dwindle in number and eventually they go bankrupt and sell it to some secular corporation. It shouldn't bother us. I mean, it should in one sense. It shouldn't surprise us. When Jesus Christ comes, oh, there will be the faithful. But they will be very few. Very few. Well, verses 3 and 4 was the issue of walking truthfully. Verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, as we turn our notes, is talking about acting faithfully. And that's what he says in verse 5. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially when they are strangers. Well, let's look at the when, who, how, what of this portion here. When you're acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, whatever you do for fellow Christians indicates that you are acting faithfully to the Lord, right? There's this familiar verse, I assume it is, in Matthew 25, dealing with the day of judgment. It says in Matthew 25, and the king... That will be Jesus. All judgment has been entrusted to him by the Father. And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. When you went out of your way to help, to serve a fellow Christian, even one that the world would consider the least of them, Jesus said, you did it to me. All the while, we were probably focused on this individual helping this one, but Jesus Christ was accepting it. You were doing it for one of his daughters or sons, and he said, you did that to me. No wonder, he says, when you accomplish it for the brothers, you're acting faithfully. Even to those who are strangers. Hey, I just want to put a little parenthesis here. You know the word hospitality literally means love of strangers. Oh, we've got this one warped in Christian circles. Romans 12 says, be devoted to one another, and it gives a whole series of things as to how we are to be devoted to fellow Christians, but one of the things he mentions is practicing hospitality. Practicing indicates it is an ongoing pattern. Not that, well, yeah, uh, last year sometime we showed some hospitality. No, it's to be an ongoing practice. Hospitality a love for strangers. Here's where Christians have got it all goofed up. We think hospitality is, brother and sister, we'd like you to come to our house for a meal. And they reciprocate the following week. Well, listen, you had us over last week. We'd like to have you over this week. And so it's a mutual eating society. Right? But, but that's not really what the word hospitality means. It means showing love not to people that you know and are bonded together as much as it is to strangers. First Timothy 3, an overseer then must be, and it gives a whole list of requirements for a man to function as an overseer. And one of them is he has to show hospitality. First Timothy 5, let a widow be put on the list. What list? On the list for financial support from the congregation. Let a widow be put on the list only if she has, and it gives a small list of things that she must have accomplished in her life before her husband died. And one of those is she has shown hospitality to strangers. 
if that hasn't been a practice of her life, then the church shouldn't feel obligated to financially support her. She has to meet all the requirements there. And finally, 1 Peter 4, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Ah, here's where it comes in. Hospitality to fellow believers, even though the word hospitality means love of strangers. Invite the brothers and sisters over when you have the opportunity. But mind you, the premise there should be for strangers. Well, that's the who, especially when they are strangers. <laughs> Here's an interesting verse in Hebrews 13. You'll have to come to your own interpretation of it. It says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this, by showing hospitality to strangers, some have entertained angels. And the word angelos, translated angels, is really the word messengers. Show hospitality to strangers because when you do this, sometimes you will unknowingly show kindness to messengers without knowing it. Are these angelic manger, uh, messengers from heaven? Now, you do find a couple examples in the Old Testament where human beings interact with angels and they're not aware of it, completely oblivious. They think it's a fellow human, not knowing that it's really an angelic being sent from heaven down here with a message. I wonder if the messengers are angelic from heaven above, the third heaven, or if they are messengers from the church, is these traveling teachers. Well, you wrestle with that in your own mind. See if you can figure it out. Here's how you are acting faithfully. These traveling teachers, they bear witness to your love. Well, I suppose if you were to be known at your funeral service, your memorial service after you die, wouldn't it be wonderful if the consensus amongst everyone attending was saying, this one had a tender heart. This one really loved people. This one loved more than cats and dogs. They, they loved strangers, you know what I mean? What a great epitaph to have, whether it's carved in marble at your graveside or whether it's carved in the hearts and memories of people. Well, what do you do to act faithfully, which Gaius had done and is commended for? Well, you notice what he says here. At the end of verse 6, you do well to send them, these traveling messengers, you do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. in a manner worthy of God. But before we look at the notes here, let me pose this hypothetical crazy question to you. If an angel had come down to you earlier this week and told you that Jesus Christ was coming to your house sun this Sunday evening, tonight, he's coming to your house for supper, how would you prepare your home and your meal? If Jesus Christ was coming in person to your house, the greatest privilege in all your life, the Savior was coming to your house. Well, he's not. But what if one of his children or a couple of his children were coming to your house? Would you have the same intense desire to have everything right for him? Not to show off your talents or, or your home, but just to say, I love you so much and so thankful that you've come to my house, that I've made the best dish I can. I'm sure it's not comparable to the things they eat in heaven, but I want you to know I've made this dish here because I love you. And I've cleaned up the house because in case you needed to use the bathroom, I wanted to be sure it was spick and span. You know what I mean? Would you have that same type of social grace to a fellow Christian coming or to a stranger 
that you would if Jesus Christ was coming. Send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Send them on their way. What does that mean? Well, look, here's three verses. Titus chapter 3. Diligently help Zenus. Now, I know sometimes it's pronounced Zenus, but Lois and I lived on a street called Zenus. That, that was part of this, the, the development that we lived in before moving here. Diligently help Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Paul writes to Titus and said, now listen, you have two fellows there that have been traveling through. Zenus, a lawyer, and Apollos, a man mighty in the scriptures, a man full of zeal and an excellent preacher. They've been with you. Send them on their way so that nothing is lacking for them when they leave your church or your area. Romans 15. I hope to see you in passing, Paul writes to the Christians at Rome, and to be helped on my way by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Oh, Paul, this, this seems like a breach of social etiquette. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to come visit you and uh, spend some time with you, but, you know, I'm up. sure you guys are going to come through for me, right? You're going to send me on my way? You're going to help me out financially, aren't you? Isn't that what he's implying by this? Well, that seems a little brazen, Paul, to say that. Philemon, Paul writes to Philemon, his good friend. A friend in this letter, he writes to Philemon, he says, you know, I could command you as an apostle, but I'm appealing to you as a brother. He says, and at the same time also, prepare me a lodging, Philemon, for I hope that through your prayers I shall be given to you. Philemon, pray that the Lord will release me out of prison. He was in prison when he wrote that. And then I'm coming to your house, so prepare a place for me, brother. Well, it seems a little pushy to me, doesn't it to you? I mean, I wouldn't have the audacity to say that to somebody. Hey, uh, I'm coming over to your house tonight uh, for supper. I hope you have something good. It's Ken. We'll see you later. <laughs> He's lost his marbles completely. You don't do stuff like that. <clears throat> but here's what I want you to see. The next point, that Christians who teach could expect to be remunerated for their work. And here's some verses taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. There is an extended portion there where Paul develops this theme that traveling preachers should expect to be paid for their services. Well, that includes Paul himself. Yeah, I know, but he's saying that for any traveling preacher. Here are five reasons he gives. The first one deals with social Social expectations. Look how he develops this. In verse 7, he develops this idea of social expectations. Paul asked this threefold question. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? No soldier goes into battle having to provide his own food for him, his own clothing. That comes from the government, which army he belongs. And they will pay him some type of stipend for his military service. And they will provide the weapons and they will provide the food for him. Second question he asked, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Well, nobody. If you planted grapes... You're expected to help yourself, right? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Well, nobody. If it's your flock, you expect to be able to take the milk from the goats or the cows. If that's true in society, that a person is expected to be remunerated, it should be also in Christian service. Second argument is scriptural expectations. 
instruction. Paul says in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, and here he goes back to the old covenant, when God said, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is thrashing. If you had a thrashing wheel and the ox was hitched to it and went round and round and round and he was grinding the grain, God said, when you put an ox under that type of bond to be thrashing the grain, don't put a muzzle over his face. You let that ox stop whenever he wants to to reach down and eat some of the grain that he has just ground. And then Paul asked this question, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Well, of course he is. Why? That he gave the law. Don't muzzle the oxen. But what Paul's getting at, it is more than just the oxen. This is a general principle. General principle. Third argument is substitutive. Well, that's a funny word, substitutive. Justice, substitutive justice. Verse 11, if we sowed spiritual things to you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? We gave you the best of our time and energy to present these truths. We made the distance travel to come here we spent the time answering questions. Doesn't it just seem right that if we've given you our services, you should reciprocate by giving us from your services? Turn the page. <clears throat> the issue of sacred practice. And by the term sacred, I just mean religious. And Paul uses this, talking about even pagans in verse 13. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services, religious duties, eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with the altar. That was true if it was in the temple that God had instituted or was the pagan temples, the priest in all of those, biblical or non-biblical, those who served in those ministries received food, received money for their services. And the fifth one he uses is the Savior's intention. And he says in verse 14 of that text in 1 Corinthians 9, so also the Lord directed that those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Wait, when did the Lord Jesus ever say that? Well, he said it in Matthew 10. He said the worker is worthy of his support. Now, it's interesting, the word support means nourishment. Food, if you please. But then in another situation in Luke chapter 10, he said the laborer is worthy of his wages, which would be coins, we would think. Paul would mention a similar thing in Galatians 6. And let the one who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. <coughs> Now, of course, I stand before you with a twinge of embarrassment of even teaching this. Because you might be sitting there thinking, that rascal Harmon, he's talking about himself. <laughs> the truth is, the 19 and a half years I've been here, this church family has been very generous financially. And we have appreciated that. We've tried to live as simply as we could, but our needs were more than filled by your love offerings. Plus, plus, 19 and a half years ago, if you were to look at a financial report, the balance, the balance 
in a church budget was $347,000. I don't think any other church in L.L. Mans County would have had a balance 19 and a half years ago that big. You look at a present day financial report, it's down to 112 or 121,000. And a lot of that came through the church funds that were here before. And a portion of that wound up in my wallet. I am thankful for your generosity. I have, even when I first came here, first five years, I worked a part-time job. Previous churches, I worked 20, 25 hours a week to supplement my income. Uh, the last 14 years or so, I haven't had to do a supplemental job. And I thank you for that, for your generosity. Okay, enough about me, the old bag of dirt that I am. Let's get back to our text here. Why? <clears throat> John gives three reasons why we, did you notice we, that pronoun shows up twice in verse 8. John, or the author, the elder, whoever he is, includes himself in this. Why we should support traveling preachers. Number one, they went out for the sake of the name. Uh, the name of what? The name of their church? The name of Christendom, their own personal name? Whose name prompted them to go out and travel? Well, <clears throat> the name, that phrase, that nomenclature refers to Christ. And we know it refers to Christ because in Acts chapter 5, it says that the apostles after they were beaten, were rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And the name that they suffered shame for was the name of Christ. James 2, do they, the rich people, not blaspheme the fair name by which you were called? And we were called by the name of Christ. And that's the name that the rich blaspheme. First Peter 4, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but let that name, but in that name, let him glorify God. Second reason why we should consider supporting these Christian teachers who come is that they accepted nothing from the Gentiles. They could have, they could have done as the common practice was to go out amongst the streets and ask people, to beg people for financial help as they were going to preach for their religion. They were traveling to another city. They needed uh, funds for the boat to carry them across. They needed money for food in their travels. And they could go on the street corners and ask the pagans for help. And the pagans, since they were polytheistic, said, well, I never heard of this God Jesus, but you know, I've given to other religious causes. I'll give to you. The Christians said, no, we're not going to ask the pagans to support us. And then the author says, therefore, verse 8, therefore, in light of the fact that they do not beg from the Gentile pagans, therefore we, Christians, he concludes himself, we ought, that's the word, owe a debt. We owe a debt to support such men. Why? That we may be, be fellow workers with the truth. I'll bet you've heard lots of missionaries. I have, the ones that we support, I think every one of them that have stood here in front of us as a congregation, thanked us for the funds that we gave to them and said, you know, looking at all of our eyeballs, he said, you know, you also share in that work in this foreign country where I serve. And you might think, oh, yeah, 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 but we don't really. We just write a check, you know, we put a little offering in, in the bucket, special offering for them. We give them money out of our church funds. But, you know, you're doing all the work over there. You learn the language. You're adjusting to the culture. You're out there knocking on the doors. You're doing the teaching and preaching. You're dealing with the heartaches, the uncomfortable 
hot weather and the climate where you serve, but we're here and uh, we're just writing checks. We're, we're not really involved. Well, what this text is indicating is that when we do contribute to the needs of those who teach, we are fellow workers, but we can't be a fellow worker. I didn't get up and preach. He did. He came and taught. We enjoyed his ministry. We benefited by it. Yeah, but the very fact that you made that possible by your contributions makes you a fellow worker with the truth. We close off this with some amazing verses. You and I can become fellow workers with more than just the truth. Believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds, you and I can become fellow workers with God. Look at the verse there, 1 Corinthians 3. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul indicates that he and others who did the preaching were fellow workers with God. When they were preaching the gospel, whether it was before multitude or individuals, they were God's co-worker. God's co-worker. Second Corinthians. It says, and working together with him, with God, working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Okay, there's a 10-year-old in your family, a child, a grandchild, whatever it is. It's uh, heading towards the end of March, and you have spread out on the table before you all the receipts you've accumulated over the previous years. <laughs> you've got the tax form and the instruction book, and you're going back and forth. You're making little notations. You're working on your taxes, and your 10-year-old comes up and says, what are you doing? You say, well, I have to fill out this tax form and send it into the government. And the 10-year-old slides up a chair and says, I want to help. What would you say? Oh, sure, you, you tabulate all these over here in this little pot. Would you say that to a 10-year-old? No. No, you wouldn't. You'll wind up in prison, probably, if a 10-year-old helps you, right? You have mechanical sense. You are working in your driveway on the front brakes of your car. They've been squeaking a little bit. The pads are worn down. So you are changing the pads, and you're down there sweating. You have your wrenches and all the tools that you need. And you have a 12-year-old comes along and says, what you doing down there? I said, well, I'm changing the front pads. I said, can I do the one on the other side? No, you're not going to let him change the pads on the other wheel on the front tire. No, no. Why? It's too dangerous. This work is too important to invest it in a 12-year-old, right? Jesus Christ is building his church, which is the most precious thing in his sight. Do you really think he's going to entrust that job to you or to me? My logic says no, no way. But the scripture says yes. We have the privilege to be fellow workers. I'll screw it up. No, you won't. You'll override your mistakes. I don't think I can do this. He says, yes, you can by the Spirit's work. Did you ever think of what a privilege it is to share the gospel? Did you ever think that you and God would be co-workers together? Isn't that amazing, huh? One final quote from the Didache. I won't read it. You can on your own. The Didache, the word is a Greek word, means the teaching. Supposedly, it's the teaching of the apostles that were put down by Eusebius, who lived at the very end of the first century. It's not inspired, no indication that it is, but it gives us an insight of what at least Eusebius and probably many of the early Christians were thinking about supporting traveling teachers. That quotation is very insightful. Uh, it gives you an indication what they thought it meant to send somebody on their way in a manner worthy of God. Well, I'm five minutes over. If you're going to eat some refreshments, you'll have to eat a little faster when you get in the back building. Let's bow for prayer. 
Father, you astound us all the time. Your grace is truly abounding to us who are your daughters and sons. The very fact that you would allow us to bear the gospel, the treasure carried about in earthen vessels. How wonderful is that privilege. Help us to avail ourselves of it this week, we pray. Amen.